Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to be turning to 1 Corinthians 15, 7. I put A because we're really just doing with half the verse today, which this will be the shortest passage of Scripture that I've ever dealt with. If, if you know me, you know, I, I try to take more passages and deal with the verses individually. But um, we've been doing this study about when Jesus shows up. And as part of that study, uh, this was supposed to be last week's message. But because two weeks ago, the message is too big for me, I had to separate it into two weeks where we were uh, looking at uh, Jesus showing up to the disciples and pulling Peter aside. Um, This week, the individual I want to deal with is really the brother of Jesus, and I think it's significant why he showed up. Um, When I was growing up, well, no, this is when I'm older, I don't know why I said that. Uh, As we were older, my mom and dad, they would like to gather the family and go to like a restaurant, but they want to take all of my siblings, which there's five of us kids, and then our spouses, then our kids, uh, they would take us out to eat. So one of the places that really could handle us, because uh, there's a lot of us, was House Food Nan, so that's one of the places, uh, and it's great food. So uh, we love to go there and eat. And at this one particular event, when our kids were younger, uh, one of my kids uh, started picking their nose at the table. And my sister-in-law, uh, she said, uh, you know, they just pick up what their parents do kind of thing, you know, just looking at me like, ha ha, I got you, you know, and I have to tell you, I'm so thankful for what the Lord does for me sometimes. Okay. Because it wasn't two minutes later and my niece, her daughter was in the middle of the house of Hunan with her pants around her ankles uh, because she was learning to be potty trained. Uh, so she was getting ready to do there. And I just looked at her and I says, you know, they learn from their parents, don't you? You know, so so I praise God for those great moments that uh, uh, he gives me. But it seems to me that if we would go around this room and we would just share stories, I bet all of us would kind of have those embarrassing stories or maybe those immature moments, or maybe you and I could start listing the different people in our family. And all of us probably have that one person in our family that they kind of do immature things. They, they kind of make mistakes. Um, they could be the one that can be a little bit loud sometimes. And like, if you're in certain places, it feels like they always want to get in a fight with somebody. Uh, they can do the, some, the, the thing where they're just going to embarrass you in front of everybody. You, so you probably have that one. Matter of fact, some of you are probably like, man, I got like five or six in my family, so I don't even know what you're talking about. You know? But uh, uh, I'm, I'm in the process right now uh, where our youngest is in baseball. And again, I tell you that I love to people watch, but man, it is so much fun at baseball games because parents are so ridiculous. You know what I mean? It's like we think like this is uh, the World Series sometimes, and uh, our kids not getting enough playing time and all this. So I get to witness these things, and uh, I and I hope that I don't become that person, you know. But sometimes I just look back and I'm just like, just watch the show, you know, and and see how ridiculous. And a lot of times the parents, man, they'll embarrass their kid or they embarrass their other family members. You'll see, you know, if it's a husband, you'll see the wife kind of go. Okay, okay. And if it's a wife, you just see the husband because there's no way that he's going to touch a, a crazy woman. He'll just kind of walk away. I got to go to the bathroom, I think. Or, you know, like they just try to get out of there. So you have those moments when you have those, again, you probably have those people that uh, can be a little bit immature or embarrassing along the way. I think for um, uh, Jesus' family, you have this moment, we're going to get into it in the passage of scripture, but you have Jesus' family who really. They don't believe that he is, in fact, the Christ or the Son of God. And so when he's getting up in front of people, to them, it becomes a little bit embarrassing. They think it's a little bit immature. And we're going to find out later that they're really the more immature ones in the moment. And when I look at, for example, today we're going to be talking about James, who is really the half-brother of Jesus. But when we look at his life, there are things I look at and say, boy, James, I don't know why you didn't respond earlier, or I don't know why you didn't believe, or I don't know why you kind of mock Jesus at times. And I I have to tell you, I can't help but look at myself when I look at these passages and think, even as long as I've been a believer, that there are times that I feel, I still feel like I'm I'm immature. There's still times that I, that I fall a little short. There 
are times when, you know, we're, we're playing games with one another and I might lose my cool that I think, boy, you are certainly immature. And then it's interesting to me that when Jesus shows up in your life or the Holy Spirit speaks in your life or God the Father slightly suggests something, it's in those moments when he shows up that we're like, man, I'm, I'm being so stupid right now. And I need to change the ways that I'm responding. So I want to read this passage to you today because James has this experience. And again, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 15, it's verse 7a. And here's what it simply says. It says, then he appeared to James. That's it. You could probably memorize that verse by the time that you're done today. But then he appeared to James. So let's pray together. Father, I want to ask that you would just anoint this service today with your presence. Lord, I understand that I get up here and speak and try to be your voice, but there is no way that I could ever fully do what you do. There's no way I could ever fully communicate what you want to communicate. And that's why we ask your spirit to rest upon this place. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds. I pray that the voice that we hear from today is not mine, but it's yours. And so, Father, if there are things that I'm going over in the passages and I would happen to get them wrong or or maybe I wouldn't be clear or maybe I speak out of turn, I pray that you would clean it up in the ears of your people so that your voice is the one that they hear and not mine. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So James is just an interesting kind of um, character in the Bible because, like, really, he's the half brother of Jesus, right? Because uh, Jesus and James, they have the same mother, but we know that they have different fathers. And as we're looking at this brother of Jesus, I was thinking like, man, that would be a crazy experience, right? To be the brother of Jesus. Can you imagine like anytime you get in trouble or something went wrong, they pull everybody together, right? You know, your parents and they're like, okay, look, this got broken. Who did it? Obviously, it wasn't Jesus. He's perfect, okay? So we can go right down the line, right? Okay? You know that if, if somebody's back talking, you know, it's, it's not Jesus because, yeah, we get it. He is perfect, right? Uh, you know, if all of a sudden a dessert is missing and they're trying to figure out, don't even bother bringing Jesus in. Okay, we understand. He is perfect, right? You know, like that would be like this incredibly hard environment to be a part of. And I don't know if there was resentment because we're not really told that. The only thing that we are told, and we're told in John chapter 7 and verse 5, it says though that even though Mary and Joseph knew that what? That Jesus was literally God's son. That even though they believed those things, we read that James and his brothers did not believe, in fact, that he was the son of God. Now think about that for a moment. Okay, so Jesus is going around, and he's preaching, and he's speaking these words. And they don't believe that it's him. They don't, I mean, they don't believe he's the son of God. Matter of fact, think about this. That means every time that Mary and Joseph have told their story, that means that James and the rest of his family are like, okay, here we go. Here's this story. Mom got pregnant uh, by God. You know, like it's... They just don't believe that at all. And so they don't believe any of this is happening. And in the midst of all this, it's probably they're tired of hearing Jesus over and over again. But what's important to me is though, even though that they don't believe that Jesus is in fact the son of God, Jesus continues to have a relationship with them. He tends to be there be there with their family. Now, Jesus does make some distinctions along the way. When he does his first miracle in John and he turns the water into wine, instead of saying to his mother, mom, he says what? Woman. And there's a clear distinction in that. And the reason why is Jesus needs even his mother to understand that you, mom, even need salvation. And so there's a distinction being made. That you're not just my mom, but you are a person in this world who is in need of a savior. And so when Jesus is speaking these words, he is speaking them to his family as well. But what he continues to do is he continues to maintain relationship with his family 
as well. Matter of fact, what I would tell you is this, and we'll get into this passage in a moment, but be relational and be careful how you respond to immaturity. Because there are going to be times when you and I are around our family where they're not going to believe everything we say. Some of you have probably already found this true. Like you came to faith, you are living out the word of God, but people are testing, they're uh, they're tempting you, they're challenging you in your beliefs. And they say, well, how can you believe that as a Christian? And so they're challenging everything about you. And there's so much inside of us that wants to respond because this is our God you're talking about. This is my faith you're talking about. And we want to respond right away with the boldness and how to do this. And what's interesting to me when Jesus was being talked about. I want you to watch his response because in John chapter seven, verses one through five, it says this. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And then verse 5, which we talked about before. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. And I want you to understand what's going on because you can see some of the sibling kind of rivalry that's going on. They're like, they understand that Jesus is getting up and he's speaking in front of crowds and he's gathering people and he's speaking these words of truth and people are kind of clinging to his words and he's doing miracles and all of a sudden the brothers and stuff, they're like, they're mocking him. They're like, hey, if this is really what you want to do and you really want to be a public figure and you want to speak the truth, they said, well, let's not stay here anymore, but let's go over here to Judea because you have a far bigger fan base. Like, if you, don't, if you want to be a public figure, this is the place to do it. So why don't you go there and do it and show everybody these miracles that you can do? And they're challenging him. And if you've ever had a sibling, you know that they want to challenge you all the time, Right? So all of a sudden you say, well, I can do that better than you. And they're like, let's prove it, you know? And then what we want to do as the other sibling, we want to make them look bad. And then we want to give them a hard time. And it almost feels like that's what they're setting Jesus up to. Well, let's go to this bigger place. Let's see the works you can do if this is really you. And what's Jesus' response to it? He doesn't take the bait. You see, I'm glad again that I'm not Jesus. Because my response would have been far different, right? If my brother's challenged me, I'd have been like, yeah, let's go. We'll do this right here, right now. I'll show you what kind of power and control I have. You know, I'm gonna one-up you guys and you're gonna look so foolish. And that's not Jesus' response at all. Jesus' response is, it's not my time. I'm not doing this. I have nothing to prove to you. It's not my time. When my time comes, then we'll show it. But until then, I'm just gonna walk away. And church, what I want you to know is he doesn't desert his family. He continues to maintain relationship. He doesn't do anything to make them look bad. He is still present with them. And he just simply says, it's not my time. I'm not going to rise to this. And what I want to encourage us is this. Is it's very easy for us when people are being immature around us. For us to attack back in bigger ways and make them look foolish. But what happens when we do that is we start to sever relationships. And Jesus continues to be very relational in his family. So then what's interesting to me is James experiences this moment. But James also experiences all these moments. I want you to think about this. James is spending these moments with his brother Jesus. He hears the words that he says. And he sees the way he lives his life. He sees the miracles that are being done. He sees the blind that can now see. He sees those who cannot talk being able to speak. He sees those who cannot hear, they're able to hear. He sees leprosy being cured. He sees all these experiences along the way, and yet he still does not believe. He hears the words that he's speaking, and for these very words that he's speaking, he sees him arrested, he sees him put on trial, And even when he's put on trial, he watches Jesus in his response, and yet he still does not believe. Jesus is beaten. He's put up on a cross. And in the midst of being put up on a cross, again, where Jesus could have attacked and they were challenging him, 
Take yourself down off the cross. Again, Jesus doesn't respond because this isn't the way it's supposed to happen. And Jesus' response is, Father, forgive them for what they do. James has heard these stories, and yet he still does not believe. Jesus literally dies for this message. And at the end of the day, he still does not believe. Now, what's interesting to me about this passage that we're, that we're talking about today is that this passage right here is not found in the Gospels. But Paul refers back to it here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. The verses previous, Paul begins to talk about how God called him and how he showed up for him. And then he begins to talk about how God showed up for different people. And we've talked about some of the different people they showed up for. Showed up for the women, showed up for Peter, showed up for the disciples, showed up for the 500. He shows up for the disciples again, pulls Peter apart separately. We know that all of this is happening. But in the midst of all this, in verse 7, Paul wants you to understand that Jesus, in fact, showed up for James. Why is that important? Because this is the moment that James believes. It's in that moment that he shows up. And for us, that seems pretty easy, right? Because if you see somebody that you know and that you love, if you see them beaten, if you see them die, if you see them put on a cross and you see the spear go in their side and the blood and water flow, if you see all that happen and then three days later and some time after, like Jesus shows up to you, you're kind of like, oh, I get it. Everything you said was true. Like, you definitely are the son of God. And that changed him in such a way that when you and I get to the, the back of our Bible, we see that there is a whole book that is called the book of James. That was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. And so something happened from this very immature person to all of a sudden where he is having a moment of maturity and faith. And why? It's because Jesus showed up and spoke specifically to James. Now, what I want you and I to understand from this is that it's important that you and I show up for our brothers. It's important that you and I show up for our sisters. It's important that you and I show up for our family. And church, I want to tell you, Jesus would have had every right, if you look at this, he could have had every right to say, James, you heard everything I said. You saw all the miracles. You, see, you saw me die on the cross, and that whole time, you never once believed me. You never once believed mom and dad. You heard those stories, and you couldn't believe. You know what? I, it, you're not even worth my effort. You're not even worth my time. I'm not even going to show up to you. But Jesus says what? James, you are my family. You are my brother. You are important. You are valuable. So guess what's going to happen? I'm going to show up for you. And when Jesus shows up for James, James becomes a believer. And then he gives us these great words later. Now church, listen, you may not always agree with your family. You may not always agree with the things that they do. You may not always agree with their life choices. But can I encourage you to show up for them? You may not always agree with your coworkers. You may not agree with the way that they're living their lives and the decisions that they're making, but can I encourage you to show up? You may have some classmates that you grew fond of when you were younger, and for whatever reason, they chose to do some things, you chose to do some things, and you guys don't seem like you're on the same path, but can I encourage you when they call, like show up? You may not always agree with your parents. You may not always agree with your kids. You may not always agree with your spouse, but can I tell you that it's important for you to show up? You see, people need us to show up. There are some times in our lives where we're going through something that can just be described as pitiful, dreadful, undesirable situations. When it's important for us to have somebody show up and it makes a difference. Somebody could be going through some kind of disease, some sort of hospital stay, where they're not even sure if they're going to make it. But can I tell you the importance of showing up? 
You can have somebody that has disregarded you, doesn't want anything to do with you, kind of left your situation. And can I tell you, there's an importance in showing up. You see, when we show up, we get to show people Jesus. What we get to show them is though, even though you've been mean to me, even though you gossiped about me, even though you've slandered me, even though you've hurt me in some really horrible ways, I still forgive you enough that I'm gonna show up and show you Jesus. You know, I wanna encourage spouses. Like, there are some times when, like, you and your spouse may fight. I may get in an argument with my wife who normally sits around there, and you know what's important for me to do? It's important for me to show up. Because I'm showing my kids that, hey, this is what a mature person does. Like, we may have arguments, we may have disagreements, but your mom and I still love each other. See, there are some people that are going through what you would describe as death's door. And they need somebody to show up. It was really encouraging me this week. Um, there's a, um, a guy that I spent some time with that's apart from the church. And um, he can be a little bit raw at times, a bigger guy. And what was encouraging to me is I just visited him in the hospital. And when I visited him in the hospital, he said, and this is kind of crazy because you almost wouldn't expect this of certain people, but he's like, Chuck, I love you. And it was a powerful moment, but listen, that wasn't the most powerful moment for me. The most powerful moment for me was when he said to me, hey, so-and-so who goes to this church came to see me in the hospital the other day. And he said, man, it was a good time. I'm so glad that he showed up. And that's what I love. Because he showed up and he showed Jesus and he had this story about what he believed Jesus did. And this individual in our church listened and man, did that encourage me. Because here's a brother that I'm ministering to that somebody else is ministering to as well. Why? All because as this person is going through cancer, somebody showed up. And I want you to know that it's important for you to show up no matter where your family is. Because who knows, maybe that will be the day that they see Jesus and make a decision to follow him. The other thing I want to say to you is this, and this is just looking at the bigger picture of James. This doesn't involve a lot of scripture, but I'm not ready to tell you, but here's what I want you to understand. If you ever get into the book of James, one of the things you're going to notice about the book of James is James is very bold, he's in your face, and he's very practical. The other thing you're going to notice about James is this. When you're reading the book of James, it's really going to sound very similar to the Sermon on the Mount, which is really a collection of things that Jesus said over time. Now, here's what I want to say to you. James was not a believer, but he still heard every word that Jesus said. And the reason why I was going to make this a Mother's Day message, and so I want to make it either a parent message, I want to make it a friend message or this, this is what I want to encourage you with. There is still responsibility for you and I to speak the truth in love. Because there are people still listening. And I want to challenge you, parents, on this. You may think that your kids are not listening. You may think that they're not capturing anything that you're saying. But as a pastor, I've had this, I don't know if you describe it as a wonderful opportunity, but it's a meaningful opportunity. When I get to be with family members when a parent dies. And it's always interesting to me when I sit down with the kids and the kids will start talking about their parents' faith. And yet they're not believers. But they'll start talking about their parents' faith. They'll start pulling out journals or they'll start pulling out their Bibles and they'll see those notes written there. And all of a sudden, it clicks for them. Man, my mom or my dad was the real deal. And they spoke this truth and they spoke it in love and I need to listen to it. And the reason I wanna encourage you with that is this, is think about this for a moment. James, the whole time Jesus was alive, didn't believe in any of the words that he said. But when he died and when he showed back up, he believed. And if I can encourage you with this, parents, In this lifetime, you may never see the words that you said 
you may never understand that it made a difference in your kid's life, but there may be a moment when I sit with them or another pastor sits with them when they'll be like, oh, that's what mom and dad meant. And that's enough to change my life. You see, maybe it's not time, but the Holy Spirit will find a time when he will minister to their spirits because of words that were spoken and the words that were done in love. When you look at the life of Jesus, what you'll notice is Jesus takes several opportunities to speak to people the truth in love. Remember the woman that was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus and they were getting ready to stone her and Jesus says, who is, who is without sin cast the first stone and they all drop their stones and they walk away and he says, who's, to, who's here to condemn you? He says, I don't condemn you either. And he says, but listen, but go and sin no more. In other words, you can be forgiven. And you and I, as parents or believers or other people around, need to understand that truth as well. I don't condemn you. I don't have the power to condemn you for one thing. But here's what I know. You can be forgiven. You can sin no more. You remember the woman that was at the well who had been with so many men and even the guy she was with was not married and Jesus spoke the truth in love and told her, well, even the guy you're with, he doesn't love you enough to really marry you. But there's a far greater love out there that you can experience. And I go and tell others about it as well. There was uh, Peter who Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times. And he warned him with that. But here's what's interesting. Even when he warned him with that, the the truth was still the same. But Peter, I'm still going to use you. You're going to be forgiven of this. I just want you to be aware of this so that when you minister to others, you have a story to share as well. You remember the guy that came up to Jesus and said, what does it, what does it take to inherit the, you know, eternity? And Jesus says, go sell everything you have. What Jesus was trying to do is speak truth and love because he was trying to say to the gentleman, like, look, man, there's one thing that's holding you back. You got this wealth. You're not, you're, you're, you don't want to give it all up. He says, I just need you to be sold out for me. But he always spoke the truth and love. And here's what I want you to know. When Jesus shows up in your life, He wants to speak truth, not because he wants to condemn you, but because he loves you and he wants you to experience grace and he wants you to walk from this a changed person. You see, church, there are times when I look back at my life and I say, man, what a fool I was. How many stupid things did I do along the way? When I was talking about card games that I played, I mean, how many times I've been playing cards with my family and I'm so competitive, you know, that I I do or I say stupid things or I pout because I'm mad. You know, and I don't like the cards that I was dealt. And so I get aggravated and I look so stupid. I'm so immature in those moments. And then the Holy Spirit says, say, hello, you're an idiot. He probably doesn't say that harsh, but that's the way I feel in those moments. You know, I mean, there are times when I'm having a disagreement with my, my, my spouse, you know, and uh, if I'm getting loud, my wife, she'll grab my arm, like to say like, that's it, you know? And then I, I usually like calm down, you know? Now, here's the other thing. I know that if she's starting to go off, I can't do that. All right. It's a good way to lose an arm. All right. What I do is one of these moves. I'm like, uh, I'm going to back out for a moment, you know, and just think about what you've done. And then I immediately start praying that the Holy Spirit will get a hold of her, right? You know? But yet, but we can be so immature and we need the Holy Spirit, Jesus, to show up in our life to say, hey, let's change this. And then we need to respond to it. But there's an importance of Jesus showing up. And here's the, the, the great thing to me about James. The book of James is really phenomenal to me. I love it because, again, he's, he's very in your face. And, and, and man, James has this moment where he goes from such an immature believer to a very mature believer. Matter of fact, we know later that he becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem, which is a big deal. But I want you to listen to some of his words. Like when you get into verse two, he's like, count it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Man, that's a lot of maturity, right? He's saying like, even though all this junk and stuff comes your way, he says like, count it pure joy. And who he was speaking to, which we'll get into verse one in a minute, moment, he was speaking to these group of Jews that were um, cast aside because of some things that were happening and some of the leadership that was taking place and they were throwing some of the Jews all over different places in, in, in the country and so they weren't together anymore and they weren't unified and, he, and, and James told them even in the midst of all this just count that pure joy because you have a God that loves you 
and it really takes us back when you think about the Beatitudes, when Jesus is dealing with, and he says like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. Like he keeps saying that stuff over and over. And he says, look, even in the most difficult times, I want you to know that you are blessed. Or in other words, count it pure joy. I mean, James has grown immensely in his faith. He comes from a perspective of, I am not a believer, to I'm a believer, and I'm such a believer that I'm telling you that in hard times, you count it pure joy. But let's read this first verse together in James when he writes his book. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, I never thought about that until I read this verse this week and I kept reading it over and over again. And I was like, oh my goodness, I want you to notice the level of maturity. Because again, if I was James, this introduction looks way different. All right? Because if I am James and my brother is Jesus, so for instance, I am Chuck, and if one of my brothers was really famous, the way I start this statement is, I, Chuck, the brother of Wes. Because I feel like that that's going to give me, and some of you are like, I don't know if I would have used that brother, you know, but, but I might say like, I want to give myself some credibility. I want to say to myself, well, he's a lawyer in town, so if he's got a little bit of wisdom, I probably got a little bit of that too. So here's how I want to introduce myself. If I was James, the way I would have, I would have introduced myself is, I, James, the brother of Jesus, and then a servant. Why? Because I would have wanted credibility. I would have wanted the church in Jerusalem to know that, look, I am the half-brother of Jesus. I was there when he was a child. I heard the story of my parents. I saw the way that he lived his life. And then I became a believer when he faced, when I came face to face with him after the resurrection. Like I am the brother of Jesus. That's the way I would have introduced myself. And in his maturity, the way he addressed himself is not that I'm a brother of Jesus, but that I'm a servant of Jesus. And I think about this, because in a world we live in, we want to make a name for ourselves. And James didn't want to make a name for himself. He wanted to make a name for Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one that can save you from your sins. James knew that he didn't have the power to do it. Only Jesus does. You see, church, what you and I need to understand, whether we're parents, whether we have coworkers around us, you and I need to help those around us mature in their faith. You and I need to show up in people's lives and show them there's a different way to react or respond to situations. You and I, if we're coworkers with other people, and man, it feels like the boss is coming down on us or he's asking us to do extra work. Like you and I need to respond with a favorable attitude and a loving way and say, let's just get it done and be an example and teach others how to mature around you. You're having problems with your spouse one day and you're getting into arguments. Show the people, your kids and your family members around you what a mature believer acts like in a marriage and how they don't walk out and how they stay faithful to it. You know, you want to show that you're a mature believer? Then let's act and respond differently and help those around us to grow. You see, when Jesus shows up, it makes a huge difference. And then the testimony we give is not about us. It becomes about him and he gets the glory. Would you stand with me this morning, church? And let's pray together. Father, I just want to again thank you for your word. And even though we just dealt with really this one simple phrase and that you appeared to James. Father, I pray right now that you have shown up and you have appeared to us today. And Father, we ask that you would keep appearing to us as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time in reading your word, as we spend time in our cars, as we just go throughout our day. If there are times that we have mistreated our brother or sister, if there are things that are wrong in our lives, would you appear to us through a spoken word, through a thought, through a song that would say, hey, let's change this. 
And for some of those of us who may feel down or out and feel like we don't even know how to continue on in life, would you show up and let us know that we're loved and that we are valued? I mean, when you showed up to James, you said not only are you a brother, but you are someone that I love and that you are someone that I believe in. And so, Father, may we understand that you believe in us and that you love us. We thank you for this time together. May we walk out of this place more mature because of hearing from you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, enjoy the day. God, enjoy the sun and figure out how to be a mature Christian around those around you. We'll see you next week. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.